Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name's Dick, and I am an alcoholic. Hi. And it's good to be here, and it's good to be with Bill this weekend. He was kind enough to come up to uh, DFW and pick me up. Uh, Friday night, and we had a good time sharing on the way down. And before I get caught up in my most favorite subject, which is me, uh, I'd like to thank the committee. Uh, it's not easy for me to thank the committee, because I don't like committees. Uh, I've served on a lot of committees. I've never been comfortable on them. I think the only wisdom I ever saw about a committee was on the front of a church one time. I saw a sign that said, for God so loved the world, he didn't send a committee. Uh, there's humor in that because it happens, and in my business, all my major clients are committees. They're called boards of directors, but they're really just committees, and uh, so God's getting even with me for this rotten attitude. <laughs> but I really do. I, I, I thank them, uh, 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 not necessarily for asking me to come to Waco, Texas, although I will say Waco's a nice town. It's, uh, uh, you know, Texas has a lot going for it, but one of them isn't geography. <laughs> Maybe that's why uh, you all come up to Crested Butte now in the summers. Is that, uh, I mean, you know, I would suggest, by the way, if you all don't know about it, there is a, a bunch of uh, uh, particularly deranged folks from D- uh, Dallas who have organized a Texas AA meeting in Crested Butte, Colorado. <laughs> that makes sense somehow, but uh, you, you, you got to think about it. <clears throat> But I, uh, it, I'll, I'll warn you, it's one of the more expensive conferences you'll ever go to, but it's worth it because of one thing. you got to be among a bunch of winners if they're willing to drive from Dallas, Texas to Crested Butte, Colorado just to go to a conference, right? So you got to be one leg up on it right away. But it really was a fun time. We were, we were fortunate enough to be with them last summer, but it, and it's good. Now, that's the kind of stuff that I love about Alcoholics Anonymous. It makes absolutely no sense at all. If there's no rhyme or you know, we would drive the American Management Association stark raving mad if they ever tried to come in and do a study on us. <laughs> People are doing studies on us a lot, I notice these days. We've become very popular. You know, we've got to watch out that uh, we don't let the, uh, the people who are just trying to get ahead in the world come in. Uh, <laughs> I was sitting in a first step meeting Thursday, uh, and uh, I got trying to liken it to why is it I love Alcoholics Anonymous so much and, and the people in AA, because I happen to think that the, the, the best thing that ever happened to me was that I came in AA. I think that's the best thing that ever happened in my life. I didn't think of it at the time, however, so if you're new, you don't have to understand that. Just take my word for it. But I was trying to liken the first step to uh, my partner in business has an expression about people who hit the wall doing 80. Well, it occurs to me if a guy's driving a car and he hits a wall doing 80, he has one of two problems. He has a driving problem or a wall problem. <laughs> I had both. I had a driving problem because I was uncontr- because of alcohol was unmanageable in my life. I could not control alcohol. And I had a wall problem because I kept hitting walls even when I wasn't drinking. I always hit more walls when I was drinking, but I would hit walls without it, too. And one of the reasons I love Alcoholics Anonymous is that where are you going to find a group of people who are willing to hit walls that often? You know, there's a certain elitism to this, that uh, people who aren't willing to get out there and hit walls all day long are kind of dull people. But here you've got a group of dedicated wall hitters who can sit around and share that with one another. And I think that kind of weeds out the faint hearts. I really do. I, and that's one of the reasons I'm glad to be. It's kind of like, you know, the Al-Anons. They're, are, they're, really, they're a very lot like us. They are. They're very, they're very much like us, except when it comes to the drinking thing, they couldn't cut it. <laughs> there seem to be a certain proportion of people in the world who aren't willing to throw up every day and go through bankruptcy <laughs> and pain and jails and degradation and humiliation, you know? Yeah, you know, I'm sitting here. Another thing that strikes me this morning is about Alcoholics Anonymous. One of, the, one of the beauties of it is 
We are the, one of the few societies who some of our revered citizens have names like Wino Joe. <laughs> <laughs> You, would, you wouldn't have gotten anywhere else. You wouldn't have gotten very far anywhere else. You know that, don't you? <laughs> this was your only shot. <laughs> that why you hung around? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, those are our heroes, right? Boxcar Bill. We had a guy like named Boxcar Bill in Seattle. Well, that's the reason I love. That's the reason I love alcoholics now. You're you. This is the only place I could have found you. And you are the most interesting group of people. You who are addicted uh, biologically and mentally to the chemical ethanol, and those of you who are addicted to living with it, who are addicted to living with the addiction. I know that's true because my wife has told me that. <laughs> she said there was just something wrong with me that was just irresistibly drawn to your sickness. Anyway, I am happy to be here and I appreciate it. And it's, uh, it's nowhere else on earth I'd rather be right now, this morning. Because it's a privilege also, and it truly is a privilege to be able to participate. More and more as I do this over the years, I am increasingly impressed with how ill-equipped I am to do it. <laughs> and I, stand, I sit up here going through that little thing, you know, with the chairman's. Best thing I can say about yours was it was short. <laughs> Now I appreciate Bill, but uh, I increasingly have that sense of, uh, of ineptness uh, as I do this, and maybe that's good. It's maybe like a guy named Paul who talked to talked to his God one time. He says, "Why do you leave me with this thing that bothers me, that bugs me so much? I've prayed, I've done everything I can. Why do you leave this thing with me that bugs me so much?" And God said, "So you wouldn't forget that I'm the answer." And maybe that's the reason. Maybe that's the reason I have an increasing sense of of. Uh, of uh, lack of ability to do this, because God is my answer. God's the only answer. If you're here at Alcoholics Anonymous to find a way to uh, live without drinking, without God, I think you're going to have a problem, because I don't think we have any other answer. The big book says that what we have here is a spiritual way of life, and that's what I'd like to share with you this morning. Uh, I got here honestly. Um, I have had three phases of alcoholism in my life. The first one was I had two alcoholic parents. And, and by age 14, I had thoroughly convinced myself that I could not control their alcoholism. Um, I'd like to share something a little later that's been kind of a fun thing for my wife and I lately, which is that we have become active uh, in a small group out in the country outside Denver of adult children of alcoholics, which is absolutely a marvelous organization. And it's also a tremendously fast-growing organization. It's awesome, the numbers of people that are attracted to that. And not just people in AA or Al-Anon. Uh, but in our little group, we have about 20 regulars that meet in Franktown, Colorado. Now, I know you've never heard of Parker, Colorado, but Franktown's a lot smaller. <laughs> you know, that's, that's one of those things that makes no sense. Because in, in Franktown, Colorado, which is an intersection of two state highways, about 35 or 40 miles out of Denver, which has a gas station and a couple of, and a liquor store, of course, we have one of those, uh, and two uh, kind of, you know, little convenience markets and uh, a little office building where there are some uh, realtors who sell farmland, and, and then on one corner there's an equipment dealer, and that's Franktown, Colorado. But yet there is a meeting every Saturday night of adult children of alcoholics with over 20 regular me uh, members. That doesn't make any sense either, does it? Especially on Saturday night. And over half of those people have never participated in AA or al -Anon. We don't know where they came from. The, uh, the thing that I learned <clears throat> out of having two alcoholic parents was that there's a way to get by that I thought worked at the time. That when you find yourself in a situation which is intolerable, there is a way that you can get by. However, I didn't realize that you pay the price later. And that is that I learned that I could exist in that environment if I would hate strongly enough. I learned how to hate my parents, my older sister, and everyone around me. And by building up that wall of hate, I was able to survive. Because that meant that you couldn't get to me. If you hate somebody strongly enough, they can't hurt you any longer. They just can't hurt you any longer because you don't care. You just don't care. And I learned to, to get along that way as a young, as a young man. And it worked long enough for me to find another solution. 
something else which allowed me to feel the way I had always wanted to feel. And we all know what that was. You know, practically nobody remembers the first time they had Chateaubriand. But every drunk remembers the first time he got drunk. And mine came as a result of stealing some uh, peppermint schnapps from... <laughs> not good this choice right off the bat, but uh, another guy and I stole some booze from a, from a house in the neighborhood because he knew it was empty. He was the paper boy on that route. And we went out in the bushes and we drank peppermint schnapps and I immediately developed a pattern which I was never to vary. And that was, I drank enough to get drunk, I threw up, I passed out, and I woke up and began to plan the next time I'd do it. And that was my drinking. That was my best drinking. I also was involved in a vehicular problem on that occasion, which also became a pattern of mine. It happened that that night I smashed my bicycle into the side of the house. <laughs> which finished up the last pattern I had, which is I always wound up in negative discussions with the current authority figure in my life. <laughs> now that varied from parents to teachers to commanding officers of squadrons to bosses, but it always was the same dumb conversation. Why do you do what you do? There is no answer to that question. An alcoholic does not have, he will give you a lot of verbiage, but there is no answer, I want you to know. You can ask them that, and they'll talk a lot in response, but there really isn't an answer to that. And you think to yourself, what a stupid question. Of course, whenever we talked about my behavior, I always talked about my potential. <laughs> I was an enormous ball of unrealized potential. And one of these days, I was going to put it together. One of these days, when I wanted to. I always let you know that I had all the potential, but did not choose to apply it to the current situation. I drank enough alcohol that I got addicted to it. I didn't know that that, that would happen. And I didn't mean to, because I swore I'd never get to be like my parents. And as my father later, later told me, son, you weren't like me. You went way beyond anything I had ever done. <laughs> I couldn't have thought up on a clear day stuff that you've done. I drank enough that I uh, uh, that it, it had interfered with every major area of my life. And that, to me, is the definition of alcoholism. Alcoholism is a disease which uncontrollably interferes in the major areas of your life, such as your own self-respect, your own self-esteem, your relationship with your family, your relationship with your job, and your relationship with other people. There's a trick about relationship problems, though, that took me a long time to learn in Alcoholics Anonymous was that I had one of the worst forms of relationship problems with other people, which is I had no relationship with other people, including my own wife. She said, I've been married to you for X number of years, and I don't know you. Boy, those are lonesome words. Those are really lonesome words. I've been married to you, we've had sex, we have children, and I don't know you. Well, I drank enough that I tried to commit suicide because of it, and that occurs to me that's not good drinking. <laughs> It seems to me that pro drinking must be a problem when you commit suicide, try to commit suicide because of it. But with a deep sense of failure in my stomach, I realized that I had screwed up two suicide attempts. The problem was they were both honest suicide attempts. They really were. They were as honest as I could get it. The first time I lay on a bed crying because I didn't have the guts to shove a knife in my chest. Now, you know, you know a lot of people don't lay around watching television with a knife in their chest. <laughs> I wonder what they do during the commercials. <laughs> the other time was that I stuffed rags in all the windows and all the doors and turned on the gas and went to sleep. I woke up with a headache. <laughs> probably got bad gas. I don't know. It's my luck. I was getting bad liquor and bad ice all the time. I probably got some bad gas. The... Uh, uh, the tale of my alcoholism is dull and boring. It's stupid, boring, and glum is what it is. Uh, and I'm not going to try to teach you how to drink alcohol. Because I think we all know that, or we all know how to go crazy watching people drink alcohol. So I think, you know, we probably covered that subject adequately. You know, if you drink enough alcohol that you contemplate suicide, you have a drinking problem. 
I'd like to also congratulate, do we have anybody here, who, who, who's here for the first convention ever, or first time you've ever been to, isn't that marvelous? Hey, great. I think those hands being raised are enough to keep the committee going for another year. Because you realize that there are people who would not have gotten to their first conference. I got, a, I got a tip for you. If you only have X number of hours, use some of them on conferences because the people who go to the trouble to go to conferences are generally a better chance to be the people who can help you more than others. There's a thing about showing up that has a lot to do with success in AA putting out some effort, so I really congratulate you. But I do want to congratulate you because frequently people who are new, are new in alcohol, are new to conferences, are new in AA. And I want to congratulate you that on a Sunday morning, beautiful Sunday morning when you could be doing all kinds of things, that you have chosen to attend a meeting of a group who say that the only requirement for membership is for you to admit you're a failure. <laughs> That's why we're so glad to have the newcomers. Yes. <laughs> It's tough to grow with that public relations policy. <laughs> well, we have news for you. We agree you are a failure. We hardly ever get successes here. So you're in the right place. It's the only place in the world that, you can, that, that your failure can become an asset. That's one of the tricks that we have here that we don't tell you about is that we're the only place you can go where your failure is an asset. And it's a real asset, too. It's not just some warm, fuzzy, you know, sort of gooey, sentimental kind of a thing. The reason that your failure is an asset is you just might save somebody's life because you're a failure. And I think that's a darn good reason to call it an asset. And that's what I'm grateful for. And I'm really wandering up here this morning. So you're supposed to talk about what it was like, what happened, and what it's like today. Okay. What it was like. I tried to commit suicide. I uh, damaged every uh, uh, dear and sweet relationship in my life. I ran amok through other people's lives. I was running from fear constantly. I walked around with a nine in the pit of my stomach all my life that was only temporarily relieved by alcohol, and as time went by, it was decreasingly relieved by larger and larger amounts of alcohol. It took more and more alcohol to get less and less effect. And so I was just kind of losing that deal. On uh, December, or, uh, uh, early in December of 1968, I was sitting by myself uh, on a, one evening because my wife had gone to a sensitivity group. We were living in Santa Barbara, California at the time, and she had taken up sensitivity groups at this time. Now, she and I had pretty much agreed that she was my problem. <laughs> That's how sick she was. I had verbally and emotionally intimidated her to the point that she thought that she, that she was walking around with guilt <clears throat> over, uh, over what had happened to me for being married to her. She had to be sick to come into that deal in the first place, and you know, which she readily admits. My wife and I uh, uh, think that the fact that we're married is the proof of a is the greatest proof of the existence of God that we can possibly ever document. For two reasons: number one, we believe that by putting us together, He spared two other people. <laughs> Secondly, we just celebrated our 20th anniversary, and that is the proof there's a God. If you knew what being married to one another was like for us, you'd know there was a God. <laughs> Human will and effort cannot have accomplished that, because we have done almost everything you could imagine wrong in our marriage, and we're still married. And the crazy part about it is we couldn't be more pleased. We just couldn't be more pleased. Anyway, on February 16th, uh, 1969, I woke up after having taken what I did not plan on being my last drink. I would not have gone out on cheap red wine uh, if I had known. That was my last because I was a fairly classy drinker. No, I thought I was until somebody pointed out to me that cheap bourbon and expensive scotch look the same when you throw up. 
<laughs> but I walked downstairs and I made the fatal mistake that no alcoholic should ever do is I began to talk to my wife about my drinking and she seemed to have a whole lot stored up that she wanted to say <laughs> well about an hour later I got her quieted down <laughs> and I asked her to call Alcoholics Anonymous and that was the first time I ever made a connection that Alcoholics Anonymous and I had anything to do with each other and that was in spite of the fact that I had a parent who had been sober for eight years. Somebody who spoke earlier this weekend talked about the fact that uh, their, I believe it was their father, had not ever mentioned AA to them. And I am one of those people who are blessed by having had a parent in Alcoholics Anonymous who loved me enough and understood me enough to have never mentioned it to me. Now, they mentioned they were in Alcoholics Anonymous. There is the theory of attraction. But they understood the difference between attraction and promotion. In later years, as my mother and I would go to meetings together and we'd drive home, I would ask her about that and what it was like to be a member of AA at eight years knowing you had a child going through what I was doing. And she said, I just hung on because I didn't even know, I couldn't even tell you for sure they were right. But AA kept telling me the difference between attraction and promotion. And I believe that very much. I do not believe that that means that we, that we have to be so uh, attractive and non-promotional that we don't go out and tell some poor drunk who's killing himself that he doesn't have to live that way anymore. I don't mean that at all. But I mean in those kinds of relationships where somebody has shared with us the fact that something's working for them, I don't think it works to pack it in their left ear. I know that my mother was probably the last human being on earth that I would have accepted it from. And I would have probably stayed away from Alcoholics Anonymous just to prove that she was wrong. Anyway, I went to my first AA meeting and I began to have the relationship problems that I've continued to have all my life. You see, because I've always had relationship problems, but now I can't have a non-relationship anymore because I'm going to meetings. AAs will not allow you to have a non-relationship problem. They're really pushy. <laughs> they come up and ask you very personal questions, unsolicited, and they make all kinds of offers, which after a while it just gets boring to keep turning down. So it's very difficult. So I began to have the other kind of relationship problems, which is that I immediately began to compare myself to everybody else. And whenever I compare, we never tie. I either feel superior to you, or I suspect that you may have something going for you that I don't have, which automatically I attribute to your being a phony. <laughs> I had a terrible time in the early days of AA because in Southern California it's mainly speaker meetings. And in those days, I only heard parts of what the speaker said. And I sobered up in, in Santa Barbara and then uh, a few months later I got promoted because I was in AA. That's another one of those crazy deals. I got promoted because I was in AA, not, you know, not in spite of it. Because I turned down a promotion to move back to Los Angeles, the company I was working for, and finally I uh, kept turning it down until they, until they forced me to come in and talk to them. And I said, well, I thought to myself, here it goes. And I said, well, the reason I don't want to move down to Los Angeles is that about four or five months ago I began attending meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I really feel shaky. And they said, that's just the kind of man we need, somebody who takes care of his problems. And that was the last discussion I ever had with my boss about my drinking or my membership in AA. So I moved to Los Angeles and, be, and immediately began to get lost in the meeting. The bigger the meeting, the easier it is to get lost in. I would come late, leave early, and I would hear the people like the Chuck C's and, uh, and all the others in Southern California, and I would only hear pieces of what they said. I would listen for the thing that didn't agree with the preconceived idea that I brought in, and therefore they were wrong and, and wrote off the whole deal. And that's all I'd hear. I spent my first year in Alcoholics Anonymous doing that. It was the worst year of my life. Undoubtedly the worst year of my life. It was the first year I spent in Alcoholics Anonymous. Because I had taken alcohol out of my body, out of my way of life, and I had replaced it with nothing. And I mean, I was worse than a loser at that point. An alcoholic is a loser, but an alcoholic who can't drink is worse than a loser. So I spent one year around the edge of AA doing that. And I can tell you honestly, it was the worst year of my life. 
I had resentments that were like bells in my head. I had depressions that were like having a second person in the car. I had anxiety that was like somebody had electric cord that they kept zapping my back with all the time. They would take the two ends of an electric thing and keep zapping. Now I had that sensation every day of being sparked from behind with this tremendous sense of anxiety. And I spent a year living that way. <clears throat> My higher power and I, God as I choose to call him, have always had a very uh, fun relationship. My relationship with God has always been fun. It has always involved humor. It has always involved irony. It has always involved him communicating to me in a way that I understand. And it was at this point that after a year of sobriety that God chose to talk to me through Jack Lemon. I went, I, I threw a temper tantrum at the office one day and left <clears throat> and happened by mistake to go to a clean movie. <laughs> And uh, it was a movie called April Fools, and it was a story about this really nifty guy who was unappreciated and working for this meaningless big corporation, married to this woman who was just kind of a whining drag all the time, and he was just mired in this terrible humdrum life, and aha, and I made a conscious sober decision, no booze, no, no drugs or anything, I'm a pure alcoholic, I made it here the dull way. Just drinking. Nothing for a year. And I made an absolutely rational decision. The God that did not exist was talking to me. And the end of the movie was Jack Lemons running down the concourse at, at an airport to catch the plane to fly off with the woman who understands. And in the entire theater, I was the only guy who stood up and cheered. <laughs> Immediately having understood the message clearly, hey, I'm no dummy, right? I'm no dummy. I went home and informed my wife that I was leaving. Well, she didn't react right. She didn't do it right. Because what she was supposed to do, according to the conditioning and the training that I had given her over these years, spent all this time teaching her how to react, and she didn't do it. Because she was supposed to get all excited and cry and weep and carry on and beg me not to and tell me she'd change. And she was supposed to do all those things. Unfortunately, a new insidious element had entered our relationship. She'd been, yeah, she'd been going to Revenge Anonymous for a year. <laughs> That's where they teach them, uh, you know, they teach them, you, you guys don't know what goes on at those meetings. Uh, at night, when you're asleep, they teach them to do a lobotomy through your ear. <laughs> That's where they teach them the principle of building up through guilt. You see, I am a member of Al-Anon, so I can joke about it. But, uh, Jay didn't react right. She didn't do it well at all. Because she kind of just sat down in the chair, and I'll never forget the ugly look on her face because it was calm. <laughs> and she said to me the cruelest words I ever heard. Do you want the color TV? <laughs> doing drama, you know, we alcoholics, we love drama, and I'm doing drama, and she's releasing with love. Well, to save face, I moved out. And I began subconsciously to cut all the ties to my own world, my known world at that point, because I left my wife. I began to plan when I was going to buy the boat and live down at Marina Del Rey and get in with all those people who were enjoying all those things that I was missing out on now. And uh, I was going to quit my job. I was going to do all those things. 
But there was only one problem. I had never been so miserable in my life. It was like a dull, screaming pain in my head. The anguish that I was walking around with at this point. I hope I'm cheering up the newcomers. <laughs> anyway, I made a mistake one night and got honest in an AA meeting. And after the meeting, a man walked up to me and said, My name is Hal, and I think you better stick with me. He didn't ask me if he could be my sponsor. <laughs> As I told him later, I said, Remember, I never asked you. <laughs> But he took me over. And he was an out-of-work actor and had nothing but time, which is what I needed. And he wore me down with patience. He sat me out, I realize now. He just plain out sat me. Because we would go to a meeting. Every night we'd go out and have dinner. And we'd go to a meeting. And we'd go out for coffee afterwards. And on the weekends, we'd get in the car and drive around California and just talk. And what I realized he was doing was he was just sitting there waiting for me to finally get around to being honest. He did get impatient after a while, though, and took to interrupting me a lot. <laughs> That's what my current sponsor does, too. He interrupts me a lot. My current sponsor lives near Seattle, and uh, he's been my sponsor now for about 10 years. And uh, I have to call him long distance for the privilege of him insulting me. <laughs> Uh, he'll usually start out the conversation like, uh, what are you screwing up now? <laughs> anyway, I, uh, I got so desperate, so terribly, terribly desperate, anguished. I found out that the more meetings I went to, the, more, the worse I felt. And I got so desperate that in, in absolute desperation... <laughs> I began to work steps, which I found out later is all I could have been doing in the first place. I worked steps, first of all, for kind of the wrong reason, because I wanted to be accepted. Somewhere along the line, I identified with a group of guys in Beverly Hills. It's a men's stag meeting on Wednesday night. And... For the first time in my life, I identified with a group of people, and for the first time in my life, I honestly wanted to be with a group of people. And you know, that's really helped for me. I think that's the first sign of the presence of God in my life, is that for, really, honestly, the first time, I actually wanted to be in a group of people. One of the greatest honors I ever had was after about two years of sobriety, or two years of being there, three years of sobriety, and I was asked to be on the steering committee that, that meeting, and you know, I could never tell you how honored I was. No promotion I've ever received or no client I've ever gotten or no case that I've ever handled and, 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 and pulled off uh, has ever, ever given me the honor that I felt the night that I went home singing because I had been asked to be on the steering committee of the Wednesday night stag meeting in Beverly Hills. And I guess that's the proof there is a God because that's totally contrary to, to the way I was when I came in here. <laughs> The, uh, the only thing I have to share besides my experience is my strength and my hope. And I'd like to talk a little bit about my strength. I am increasingly aware that I am operating in life at a level about 300% beyond my ability. I, uh, in my personal life, in my... Uh, family life, in my job life, I am operating at a level that is far beyond that which I am capable to perform. I'm just not that smart. I'm just not that steady. I'm just not that perceptive on my own. So there must be something else in my life that is, that is operating, that is allowing me to operate well beyond my own capabilities. And it took me a couple of years of sitting around AA meetings to discover what it was because, you know, we hide things from alcoholics. We hang them on the wall. <laughs> alcoholics don't read things on walls because it's expected of them. <laughs> and almost every meeting in Southern California in those days, there was a little sign that hung up on the podium that said, but for the grace of God. 
See, and it's the grace of God that's the difference between my ability level and where I am operating. Now, I'm not trying to convince you or wow you or impress you with my life. Only the fact that wherever I am and whatever I am doing, I do not have the ability to do it. But the grace of God operating in my life allows me to do it. There's a word in the other, there's a phrase in the other big book that singularly impressed me recently. And that was that, uh, uh, the phrase was that as you go around holding out the words of life, you know, you and I have the words of life. For a long time in AA, I got confused, though. I thought I was the answer for the people's alcoholism. And I finally learned that God does not depend upon the messenger. I guess that's why he chose an unlikely group like us. All he depends upon is his message. It's the message we carry, not the messenger. And the message that I heard finally... Now, I happen to be one who believes that a newcomer is anybody with less than five years sobriety. I didn't like to hear that when I was three or four years sober because I wanted to be an instant old-timer. I told you I began to work steps just so I'd be accepted. I wanted to be an old-timer right away, so I figured I had to get that stuff out of the way. It's kind of like a you know initiation ceremony or something that I had to go through with working steps. But I really believe that it takes five years just to find out how sick we are. I really do. I think that the the disease of alcoholism, which I had before I drank, I had the disease of alcoholism before I drank. Because I was just reading this morning in step seven in the in the twelve by twelve, it said these character defects which allowed us to become alcoholics. That means the defects are the ism to me. That and the self centeredness. Well, we hold out the words of life. You see, and that's the strength that I have today. I have no more idea what I'm supposed to do tomorrow and how to do it than I had 16 years ago. In fact, all I have is an enormous amount of additional information that I have no idea. 16 years of sobriety has only convinced me how really stupid I am about living. But you know what? So are they. None of us have an answer to it. But I know where to go to be walked through it. And that's my strength. I know what to do. I get up in the morning and I pray and meditate. I don't pray and meditate to be spiritual. I don't pray and meditate so I can brag about it from podiums. I pray and meditate to save my butt. And because I happen to enjoy it. You know, there's an old thing about getting a newcomer asked, how long should I go to meetings? And you tell them, until you want to. Well, pray and meditate till you want to. God doesn't care if you don't want to. It doesn't matter to him at all. The strength that I have in my life today is the grace of God. And in a lot of ways that I get that. First of all, I get it in the mornings and I pray and meditate. Secondly is that I try to figure out how I would figure out how to do something and do it the other way. (laughs) You see, if I have a problem in front of me and I say, "Now now how would I figure out how to do that? I figure out how to do that and do the opposite. I want to tell you, you'll be right more times that way than you will figuring it out. (laughs) Now, my business partner has a little hard time understanding that sometimes. Because I'll tell him how I would figure out to do something and say, then, so, of course, I'm going to do it the other way. He's getting there, but it's a struggle. (laughs) Fortunately, he's a very spiritual man. But that's my strength. My strength is my relationship with my God. That's the only strength I have. I get that by praying and meditating. I get that by trying to do things His way. But what I've really been impressed about lately, and I have been rereading... Is that an editor? (laughs) That's the committee telling me. Uh, 
I have really been zeroing in on step seven. I have been enjoying step seven right now. I am consciously and actively working step seven in my life. And that's all I can share. I, you know, one of the frustrations I have in life is that I, somewhere along the road, picked up a lot of information that I wish I could share with people. You know? I got all this information and all this experience and stuff that I picked up, and I, and I once tried to give the talk that I covered it all in. <laughs> oh boy, did I lose that crowd. <laughs> But I got all this information and all these experiences I would truly honestly like to share, you know, but I can't do it. So we just take one little deal, one little, one little tiny aspect of it. And that's for me step seven right now. I, that's the step I'm working on right now. And if I ever want to get goofy, I can be in a position where I don't know what step I'm working on. If I don't know what step I'm working on, then I'm usually starting to get a little fritzy. Anyway, step seven right now. And I, you know, they've been putting new words in the 12 by 12 again. Because I came across, you know, number one, it says that alcoholics will not achieve sobriety unless they achieve some small degree of humility. You know, that's, it is kind of hard to talk about humility. And, and I remember a guy saying one time, you know, uh, humility is like venereal disease. If you have it, you don't talk about it. <laughs> but I think we need to discuss it a little bit. And we need to discuss it in terms of our own experience just because I am increasingly Im impressed with the fact that I'm dead in the water without it. First of all, it says that I must achieve some degree of humility or I'll never get sober. And then it says that unless I am willing to go for more of it than just enough to stay sober, unless I am willing to seek and strive for an increasing amount of humility beyond that which is necessary just not to drink, that I will probably never achieve the happiness that I'm seeking. Not. I've read that step a lot of times in that book. But this week, I heard it. I read it and heard it. That I will never achieve what I'm looking for beyond not drinking unless I make as a goal of my daily effort the achievement of humility. Now, that's one of those nice phrases that you think to yourself, eh, that's good, but what do you do on Tuesday morning? Yeah, it's nice to say that you're striving for increasing amount of humilities, but what do you do on Tuesday morning with that? Yeah. And we have all these great generalizations, but, you know, let's make it real. Let's make it practical. One of the reasons that I pray and meditate is it gives me a reason to compare myself to God. That will make you humble. If you think about God's personality, and by the way, he has a personality checklist. He has made himself understood. He even says what his personality is like, if you're willing to go to the trouble to find out about it. If I compare his personality and mine, that is humbling. Secondly, what I do sometimes is I will wait till my family is asleep, and then I'll go in and look at them asleep when they're vulnerable and trusting and I'll think of what they expect from me as the nourisher of the family. The word pater in Greek comes from the concept of that which nourishes, which feeds. And that crazy lady and those two kids are still somehow convinced that I am able to nourish them spiritually, emotionally, and physically. And that makes me very humble. Because this is little Dickie Grant, who until age 16 used to wet the bed. I go to work, and I sit behind my desk, and I sometimes have the feeling like I'm my, I'm my son down at my office playing daddy. You ever have that? Yeah. And I look at and I look at the stuff coming across my desk, and I happen to be in a business where I control uh, a lot of other people's monies and put it at risk. I could lose it all for them. I could lose millions of dollars for my clients if I make mistakes. And I think about little Dicky Grant who wet his bed until he was 16, and frequently thereafter. <laughs> hard to maintain long-term uh, relationships with ladies when you're a bedwetter. <laughs> and I was the worst kind of all. I was a couch wetter, too. 
You won't, you won't ever get invited back to those places. <laughs> Just this weekend, uh, over the weekend, I spent four days with uh, a group of 50 of my clients, and, uh, and I'm walking around this absolutely gorgeous place called the Broadmoor in Colorado. And uh, I'm thinking about uh, uh, where alcoholics are supposed to be spending their weekends, and it's not at the Broadmoor. Uh, it's in funny farms and, you know, hospitals and graves and places like that. And I'm thinking about all those people, and they come up to me and they ask my advice. And I almost have to laugh sometime. You know, that's, that's not where I was headed. That's just, that makes me humble. That makes me humble to think that people trust me. And, you know, and they even overlook my mistakes. That's even more humbling. When my own clients overlook my mistakes. You know? my, greatest, my greatest problem with my clients is that I think that they think that I should be perfect. And I almost drive myself crazy trying to hide the fact that I'm not. And then they knew it all the time. But that's humbling. That's very humbling. But that humility is where I get my strength. That's where I gain the strength to go on every day. Or I come to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's humbling. I don't deserve to belong to you. I really don't. Because I've had a crappy attitude so much of the time that I've been sober. I have judged you. I have evaluated you and found you lacking. I have felt different from you. I have felt special and set apart, unique. I don't deserve to have been allowed to continue around here because I've had really a bad attitude frequently in AA. That's very humbling to me. Somebody will call me on the phone and lay out their life and expect me to be able to say something that's going to make their life better. And that makes me feel humble because I don't have it. I can't cut it. I can't think that up. I'm not smart enough. All I can do is repeat what I've been taught. That's all. The hope that I have, the hope that I have is uh, uh, beyond description. Um, hope, if it's false, is cruel. If we offer you as a newcomer a false hope, we have done a terribly cruel thing to you, I believe. If you come here because drinking alcohol is ruining your life and you feel like you're dying, and we were to offer you some kind of false hope, we would be the cruelest of all people. So I, I am not prepared to tell you that if you come to Alcoholics Anonymous and you don't take the next drink, remember we're all just between drinks, if you don't take the next drink, that your life's going to go wonderful, that your wife will straighten out, that your life will straighten out, that your kids will straighten out, that your clients will straighten out. You know, and true, they won't. But we have this little trick of finding a way of living by following a few simple directions, which are the hardest kind for alcoholics to accept. <laughs> Greatest test we give you is that they're simple. <laughs> We have a way to offer you to live that as those other things go the way they're going to go anyway, whether you're sober or not, you will be able to cope. I can't promise that you'll be able to ma manipulate them and make them come out any certain way. You're going to have a spouse that dies or you're going to have a job that fails or you're going to have a kid that goes nuts or something, you know. But you can cope with it because it's probably going to happen that way anyway, whether or not you sober up. That's my opinion. So my hope is not that everything will turn into tiptoeing through the tulips. That's really, I, I tried that for a while. I almost went crazy. You know when an alcoholic is having trouble with that, there's one word in their vocabulary. Whenever an alcoholic is trying to negotiate with God, and this is how you negotiate with God as a recovered alcoholic, you stay sober a few years, and you get around, you kind of survey the situation, and you say, well, God, I've done this and I've done that, so you owe me this and you owe me that, right? 
That's called negotiating with God or trying to work him into a corner where he owes you one. I don't know about your God, but mine's never found himself in a corner yet. But there's one word in their vocabulary which you can always tell when an alcoholic is suffering from this problem. And that word is fair. Fair drives alcoholics crazy. It's not fair the way my boss talks to me. It's not fair that that guy cut in front of me on the freeway. He has to cut in front of you on the freeway. He's programmed to do that. He is powerless over cutting over in front of you in the freeway. I know. I used to be a freeway cutter. <laughs> or worse than that, a tailgater. My wife kept paying me a great compliment a couple years ago. She said, you know, I think you may get well. You quit tailgating. <laughs> The only thing I've ever found that's fair is God. He's the only fair thing I've ever found in life. He's fair, but he does it all on his own terms. And that's what I've struggled with. I've struggled in my relationship with God because I wanted him to do it on my terms. I thought that by being a good boy and not drinking and going to meetings and helping other people, uh, that, you know, then he was going to do it my way. And he doesn't. The... Uh, uh, the best way I can describe God is there's a story that uh, one of my heroes told. You know, that's one of the other great things I've gotten out of AA is I am now free to have heroes. You know, when you're a snot-nosed intellectual, you can't have heroes. you got to put everybody down. The reason the intellectuals put everybody down is that if you put everything down and you never commit to something, you can never fail at anything. Right? I wasn't even committed to my own marriage, <laughs> which really drives people crazy. I mean, I was around and I followed the rules, but she could tell deep down that I wasn't really home. Yeah. One of my heroes told a story one time. It happens that the story was about Texas. It seems that there was a, a fellow who owned about two million acres along the Brazos River. He was really the heavyweight in that part of the country. And he had two sons. And one of the sons, uh, the older son, was the kind of kid that just always did things right. And he got good grades in school and he always did his chores on time. You know, the kind you hate. You know, the kind of older, older brother or sister that's just terrible to have. My son has an older sister like that. I tell him it's the cruelest thing ever happened to him was he got a perfect older sister <laughs> I said we all have our cross to bury <laughs> anyway this older brother just kind of always did things right and he just quietly did his share of the work and everything then he had a younger son who just couldn't quite seem to fit in with the family he just couldn't quite seem to uh, to uh, go along with the rules and he just always had a reason why he did it differently or didn't do it or uh, he just never quite seemed to fit in. Well, it seems that in this family they had an understanding that at any time either of the sons wanted to, that they could ask the father uh, to uh, sell off a good portion of the, of the ranch and give them the money for it at any time they wanted, even before the father died. Of course, this meant that the father would suffer a rather large economic loss because he would have you know, lost the operating income from a good portion of his, of his ranch. But the younger son one day came to the father and said, I think I want mine now. I just can't wait. I just got to have it now. I got places to go, things to do, people to see, and I just kind of need that money right now. So the father, as the agreement was, went ahead and sold off a large portion of the ranch and gave him the money. Well, as you can imagine, uh, he discovered the uh, magic of martinis, and he... Uh, uh, became convinced that uh, when he would go into a bar and a lady would walk up to him and say that if he would buy her a drink that she would like to have a meaningful relationship, and he believed him. <laughs> he, uh, he ran through the dough, but he saved enough of it that he wound up running a cat house in Juarez. <laughs> Now, it was a successful cat house, 
in Juarez, but it wasn't what he had expected to wind up doing in life. But by Juarez standards, he was doing real well. I mean, you know, he was doing okay by their standards, but there was just something about running a cat house in Juarez that didn't seem right to him. He uh, began looking around, and one day he was sitting on the back steps of the cat house looking at the sunset, and he said, you know, this isn't really what I thought my life ought to turn out to be. Yeah, I've got a few outward signs of success, but deep down, I know that this is not what I was intended for in my life. And I know that I'm drinking too much, and I know that I'm going downhill, and I just know there's something wrong. And he happened to run across um, a fellow from, who lived in the neighborhood of the, of the ranch that his father owned and found out that his father was doing fine and that the older brother was still there working away. And, he, and he, uh, the guy said, I'll, you know, I'll tell your dad that I saw you. And he said, oh, no, please don't do that. Please don't do that. I want him to know where I am and what I'm doing. <laughs> well, this sickness inside, this kind of disgust that he got about himself grew and grew. And it grew to the point where he couldn't stand it any longer. He just couldn't stand any longer. And, uh, and because he continued to drink, he lost the cat house. And next thing you know, he winds up sweeping out the cat house that he used to own in Juarez. And this is not good living. So he made a decision. He thought to himself, you know, he said, uh, the guys that work on my father's ranch live better than I do. Just a hired hand on my father's ranch is better off than I am. I wonder if he'd take me back and just let me work on the ranch. And I, of course, I'll never own anything again. I've already used up my share and everything. So he decided that he would try, and he uh, managed to slip across the border again and and uh, start heading down the road. It seemed that he got near the ranch around around evening time, and his father had this kind of strange habit. Every single night, the father at dusk would go out and stand on a hill and look toward the west to see if his son might be coming home that day. And he'd been doing this for several years. And off in the distance, the father saw the son trudging back up the road. He had to hitchhike. He couldn't even, he was in such bad shape that he couldn't even get somebody to pick him up along the road and give him a ride. And he had to walk back. And the son looked up and he saw that figure standing up there on the hillside. And a sense of shame went through him. And he tried to hide. He tried to go over into a little ravine and hide and sneak in the back end of the ranch. But the father had seen him. And the father came running down off that hill, hooping and hollering. And ran up to that son and threw his arms around him and kissed him and hugged him and told him how glad he was to see him. And the son kept saying, oh, no. He said, no, you don't understand where I've been and what I've been doing. The father said, it doesn't matter. He said, oh, but yes, you don't know what I've done. He said, you don't know what I've been doing for a living. He said, you don't know the awful stuff that I've done. The father kept saying, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You are my son. You have always been my son, and you will always be my son. And the love that I have for you can never be taken away, no matter what. There's nothing here on earth that could ever take this love away that I have for you. So he took the son, and he took him back to the house, and he gave him his best outfit to put on, and his most expensive uh, lizard boots, and just, you know, the whole thing, and dressed him up. Well, there was a big commotion going on, and he told the uh, the hands to, you know, throw a party and to call everybody from the neighborhood in, and they were going to have a real big barbecue. And the older the older son was out on the, you know, out on the ranch, and he and one of the hired hands came by and said, "Quick, come on back. There's a big, big barbecue. Your brother's back." And the older brother came back, and he saw all this, and he saw the brother wearing the father's, you know, finest silver buckle, and the lizard, and the whole the father had given him the very best of everything, and had killed off their prize uh, uh, cow, or whatever you call them. Uh, <laughs> I knew I'd get in trouble with this. <clears throat> it killed off the one they were going to show up at the National Western Stock Show in the winter, and, and killed that one, and was and was uh, uh, was barbecuing it you know, for the crowd and everything. And the son went up and said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you know what that kid did? He took his money. He's hurt us economically. He's taken, and you know what he's been doing. We've heard the reports. You know, what's going on? This, by the way, was the first Alan on. <laughs> And he said, uh, uh, how can you do that? And the father said, 
How can you be jealous? Everything that I have ever owned, which is more than you will ever need, has always been yours. But the lost one has come home. That's what you as a newcomer in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous have waiting for you. There is a Heavenly Father standing on a hill looking for you. And all he wants to do is to be able to spot you. So you've got to show up. You do have to come. But when he spots you, he, in the guise of other people, even people with whom we would not normally associate, is going to come running to you and put your arm, their arms around you and kiss you and tell you that they love you. And you know what? Whether or not you understand it, they mean it. You see, because if you have a hard time accepting the fact that there is a father standing on that hill, you know something that doesn't matter? He's going to stand on the hill anyway. Because God's existence does not require your agreeing with it. God's going to go right ahead and exist and be what he is, whether or not you agree with it or you want to buy into it. So all we ask is that you show up. Trudge down that road. Get spotted and come on home. That's the hope that we have. We are people who suffer from a disease which should kill us or drive us insane. But we're sitting here, standing here, on a Sunday morning in Waco, Texas. Okay. You see, we are all right. We really are. If you and I simply admit that we can't control alcohol or anything else, we'll be okay. That's the promise that we have. The most difficult thing for me on a daily basis is to risk the rejection of going out and telling others that Father's waiting on the hill. I fall short on that frequently. And I found something else true to be true. You and I have been given a gift that is not solely designed for Alcoholics Anonymous, Al Anon, Alateen, ACA, and all the rest. There's a whole world out there got the same problem. They just couldn't cut it with the drinking, is all. But they got the same problem. I do not believe that you and I are gifted and taught and reared up in this ability that we acquire over a period of time. You and I, if we practice the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, become spiritually competent. We are spiritually competent. Uniquely able to handle and help people who have the terrible, blinding disease of alcoholism. We also have a message to carry out there. I think that's why it says to practice these principles in all of our affairs. I think I would be turning my back on what my father's asked me to do if I tried to keep this exclusively within the confines of AA. Number one, my, my family are not AA members. And I do know he expects me to practice it with them. My neighbors aren't AA members. Yet I'm told by him to get along with them and to try to help them. Somebody said once, what would you do if somebody told you the secret to life? I said, they don't have to. I already know it. And they said, how can you know the secret of life? I said, it's very simple. God told me. The reason alcoholics don't want to hear the secret of life is they don't want to have to deal with it. It's the same reason the people out there don't want to hear the secret of life. They don't want to, they don't want to have to deal with it either. The secret of life is, isn't that pretentious of me to say that? <laughs> In my opinion, the secret of life is, I was not sent here to acquire and consume. I was sent here to serve. Every single thing about AA checks out. You see, I have gone to a lot of trouble to make sure that AA checks out. 
if I'm going to bet my life and that of my family on something, it better check out. And it does. AA checks out with every one of the real spiritual principles which have always existed. Every one of those is geared toward one goal, and that is to serve others. Now, I think that's the roughest thing God ever asked me to do. Not to serve. That isn't it. But to have to serve people. Because people don't act like what I think they should. <laughs> that's the toughest part of the deal. Is that we got to do it with people. God, in my understanding, the last lesson that he taught was he got down and he washed people's feet. That impresses me. That really impresses me, that foot washing thing. Must have been trying to tell me something when that's the last lesson he taught. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I love you. I love, you know, my wife and I, I, I moved here. Jay and I had uh, lunch Friday before I got the plane and uh, we had two topics of conversation and one topic uh, one of the two topics of conversation at lunch was how do you know when you've really surrendered okay how do you know when you've really really surrendered your life and your will to the care of God as you understand him how do you know that and it occurred to me that I had a, I had a piece of evidence the other night I was sitting in a meeting, and so, have you ever sat in a meeting but kind of been pulled away from the meeting, like you're seeing the meeting but you're in it? Have you ever had that happen? Where you're sort of almost, ra- you almost it's, it's a strange sensation, but you're there and you're listening, but you're also up here somewhere seeing the meeting. And I had that happen to me. And I had this overwhelming urge to go around and hug everybody in the meeting. I have not had that experience in a long time where I had the tremendous sense of love for the people in that meeting. And I interrupted the meeting and told them. I mean, it was that strong. Now, what does that mean? That is completely 180 degrees from where I was when I walked in the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous. And then it dawned on me. God is love. I must be in God's will because I am capable of loving other people today. So I must be okay. I'm talking this morning, all the busyness and the humdrum of life goes along here, right? All the da 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 all the little daily deals, right? I can't tell you when it was, but it was over 10 or 12 years ago that underneath that came a current flowing in my life that says, it's okay. It's okay. Now, all the da 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 up here never changes the current here that says it's okay. Now, do we have to be brilliant, clever, bright, interesting, all those things I used to think was, was requir- were required to achieve that? Oh, yeah. We have a very complicated formula. Don't drink. Read the big book. Work steps. Go to meetings. Get a sponsor. That's all I've done. And I've learned all that. And I've found all that. And I'm okay. And you're okay. And we're okay. God bless. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.